Hey, and welcome back to another sexy settings video. This time I'm gonna talk about my video settings for the EOS R5. Full disclosure, I am a relative novice to video, but I've been doing a ton of research to sort of figure this camera out, figure out video in general, and I'm gonna share with you everything that I've come up with through talking with video experts, talking with people at Canon, and where I've landed on my settings and why. Before we get started, let me remind you that I have a podcast, it's called Photobomb, it comes out every week, and I co-host it with my good friend, Boo Ray Perry. I'll put a link to that and his YouTube channel in the description. All right, let's get started with this guy. First thing on the menu is gonna be movie record quality. Now, this is probably gonna be the most controversial of my settings and requires the most explanation. Once we get past this point, the rest of it is pretty much a cakewalk. So if you click into movie record quality, you're gonna have the option for movie recording size. And this is, this is where the magic happens right here. So you have options from full HD, that's 1080p, all the way up to 8K. Now, for what I do, mostly YouTube videos, I find that the 1080 is perfectly adequate for me. I have filmed in 4K, I've done a lot of it, and I've done a lot of research. And what's miraculous about this camera is that it will shoot in 10-bit 422, that is, if you use C-Log. And so we're gonna talk about that when we get to the C-Log settings, which is a little further into the menu. But essentially, there is a ton of data when you use that 10-bit mode. And so I record everything in full HD 1080p and I up-res it to 4K when I export. Not this video because I'm recording with the EOS RP rather than my R5, but everything that I export by the time I get it done and edited and then upload it to YouTube, it's really, really difficult to tell the difference between anything that I've recorded in 4K and stuff that I've recorded in Full HD. There's so much data in that 10-bit Full HD that the 4K export, even if it's up -res, looks pretty darn good. Now, if you vehemently disagree with me on this point and you need that room to crop or, or do whatever or you're pr producing commercial video, that's totally fine. All you have to do is move over to that 4K from full HD. So I would definitely consider doing a test if I were you. Record something in 4K and record something in full HD and just see what you get. One of the main advantages is going to be the amount of space that you save. A 64 gig card can roughly get about an hour of footage in full HD. In 4K you're going to get about 15 to 17 minutes depending on the rest of your settings. So the file size is going to be literally about a quarter of the size and the end quality is so close for YouTube that it's near enough as makes no difference. Now, if you've got a really well-trained eye, you're obviously gonna see a difference, but for most people that are your viewers, they're really not gonna be able to tell. Now, I also shoot in the 24 frames per second or 23.98. That mode is pretty controversial. Some people say 30, some people say 24. I like the way 24 looks, and so I record in 24 pretty much all the time, unless I'm trying to record in 60 frames for something I wanna slow down later. When it comes to compression, I'm gonna shoot in the all I mode instead of IPB. Now, you, you could Google a technical breakdown of the difference, but IPB is smaller. It kinda of tosses some frames out here and there to save space, and I really wanna get the best quality I can, especially since I'm gonna be shooting in full HD instead of 4K. You also might notice that if you switch from all I to IPB, you're gonna get more than twice as much room to shoot with on the card. So you do get the advantage that if you're in a pinch and you're running out of space and you're not shooting anything super important, IPB would work fine. But for what I do, since I'm mostly shooting in my studio, all I is gonna be great. So now I've got my record quality settings set and I'm gonna back out of that. I don't mess with the high frame rate or the 4K HQ mode. Those are gonna be reserved for some really excellent quality stuff that you can get by using those CF Express cards and taking advantage of what this camera can do. I know that some of you might be thinking that shooting in full HD on this camera is kind of like hanging a Picasso over your toilet, but it really just depends on what you need the video for and where it's gonna end up. So if you're gonna be shooting for, you know, HDR monitors on giant screens and for commercial video production, you obviously wanna max out the quality that you can get. If you're making talking head YouTube videos, you, you may May not need all that. All right, so I'm backing out to the main menu and the next thing is gonna be movie cropping. Movie cropping is actually a pretty cool option where you can change the perspective of your lens by cropping in artificially on the sensor in camera. Now, this has some use cases for sure. Most of you probably don't wanna do that. However, I have read some pretty compelling evidence that if you're gonna shoot in 4K and not in the HQ modes, that the crop version of the video actually turns out a better quality. Sound recording, I pretty much leave it auto because the microphones that 
I use plugged directly into the camera and the camera's pretty good at knowing when that's plugged in. I would just highly recommend that you plug a set of headphones in so that you can check your audio as you're recording to make sure that you didn't screw something up. HDRPQ is a setting that you will probably never mess with, but it's pretty rad. It gives you the ability to shoot specifically for HDR and Ultra HD monitors and screens, and that you will probably not need it, but it's good that it's there. Used in conjunction with the BT2020 color space that is pretty new, you can get some pretty great results. But again, most of us won't use this because we don't really need it, and most people aren't using HDR screens yet. Moving right along to our big, big point that we need to cover here, Canon log settings. Now, this is relatively advanced. If you are a novice video user like me, this is going to be kind of a, a big move, but it can really improve the quality of your videos and give you a lot more latitude. And this is where the R5 really shines. Mine are on by default. I, I always shoot in log unless I have a very specific reason not to because I just love the latitude I get. But here's what you need to know about shooting in C log is that when you move the R5 from log being turned off to turned on, your camera goes from an 8-bit H.264 to a 10-bit H.265. There are a couple of notable things that you want to take note of. First, 10-bit is going to give you a much wider range of colors and a better quality to a ridiculous degree. However, this camera also uses the H.265 codec, which is sort of kind of tough to edit. Even people with very expensive machines, even editing the 1080 footage, the hardware in your machine will most likely not be able to just toss this footage around no matter how much you paid for it. Now there are certain graphics cards and processors that natively decode H.265, but if you shoot in log mode, more than likely, no matter what size video you're shooting, you're probably going to end up making proxy files when you import it either Premiere or into Final Cut Pro 10. That's also one of the reasons I like shooting in full HD over 4K is that I know that I'm going to have to render this footage and it takes a lot less time. Funny enough, the easiest way to edit H.265 footage is on a newer iPad Pro because they can decode that. You're basically going to have to build proxy files into your workflow if you want to edit this footage. I know that that's a pain in the butt, but I have a feeling that in the next 18 months to two years that you'll see a lot more hardware that will natively decode H.265. If you want to avoid the hassle of shooting in 10-bit H.265, just turn off log and the footage will magically become a lot easier to edit. You're also going to lose a ton of latitude when it comes to color grading, but you may not need it. Under log settings, view assist is one of the coolest things that I think this camera does. It gives you the ability to shoot in C log while seeing what it will look like with a lookup table or LUT applied to it. The most common LUT for everything is going to be called Rec 709 and that's sort of what it applies to it on the LCD when you're looking in it. You will lose view assist if you're recording to an external recorder. It doesn't have the ability to do it externally, but it's pretty useful anyway. The next thing under log settings is going to be color matrix. Now you have two options. You have cinema EOS original and neutral. And for the most part, this probably isn't going to make much of a difference to you. But if you're doing a lot of talking head videos and YouTube stuff, you might stick with cinema EOS original because it changes the colors a little bit to favor skin tones and make them a little nicer. Whereas neutral is going to give you a lot more color accurate across the board. So if you're shooting landscapes, outdoor stuff, you know, auto racing, whatever, whatever it is that you're doing, neutral might be better. If you're just doing a lot of you talking to the camera, you might consider EOS original as a better option. I don't think you can go wrong either way but if you want more accurate colors other than just skin tones go ahead and switch that into neutral and moving right along you have color space to choose from now bt709 or rec 709 is pretty much across the board industry standard for video as far as what is going to apply to your footage i would recommend sticking with this unless you are specifically shooting hdr and this is where that hdr pq setting comes in really you don't want to shoot in hdr pq without switching to bt2020 and you don't want to shoot bt2020 without switching into hdr pq mode those two things are kind of going to go hand in hand most of us will never ever use these, so just stick with BT709 and you'll probably be just fine. That rhymes? BT709, you... never mind, moving on. Over on tab number seven in this capture and record menu, you're gonna find your image stabilizer settings. Now, there's an interesting point about this camera. If you have an image stabilized lens attached, 
the in-body image stabilization is going to be completely controlled by the hard switch on the lens. If you do not have an image stabilized lens attached to the camera, then you will need to adjust that inside the camera's menu settings, just like I have right now. So going into that stabilizer mode, you're going to have your first mode, IS, and you can turn that on or off, and that's going to be your IBIS. You will not see this in your menu at all if you have an image stabilized lens attached to your camera, but you will see digital IS. Now digital IS is pretty cool and can give you a little extra boost, but do remember if you use digital image stabilization, it is going to crop in a little bit. So you'll see that the IS crops it inside the sensor a little bit, and when you turn on enhanced mode, Enhanced mode crops in even more. And so it almost gives you that 1.6 crop because it's just zooming in on the sensor so that it can digitally adjust for your shakiness. It's really good in a pinch and it can make a difference for you. However, do be aware that it is gonna crop in quite a bit when you use it. Now we're gonna to come to one of the coolest features in this camera. I'm so glad they added this feature that's typically only in cinema cameras. You're gonna get these zebra settings. Now, essentially what this means, it's, it's gonna show you black and white stripes on any part of your picture that is blown out or where you've clipped the highlights. This is incredibly useful as this camera blows highlights pretty easily when you're in non-HQ modes. In this way, you're gonna make sure that you don't lose those highlights in your footage. When I set this up, I use zebra modes one and two in conjunction with each other and I just have those set to the default. I find that it's pretty good just the way it is. Moving on now to autofocus, I have it set up pretty much for my vlogging settings, which is gonna be tracking autofocus with the subject detecting people, the eye detection enabled, and the servo enabled. So essentially what that's gonna do is focus on my eye and it's gonna track me no matter where I go continuously. Now this does use up a little bit of extra battery power, but it's very, very useful in a vlogging situation. Now, depending on what you're shooting, you might wanna turn this off, but if you're doing talking head stuff like me, it's awesome. If you go into the third tab on this autofocus menu, you can even change the speed of the autofocus so that if you want to do some rack focusing and slow it down you can do that or if you want it to be a little zippier and move along with you you can turn it up if this video has been helpful to you so far make sure to hit that like subscribe and hit the notification bell so you can see all of my videos i put out some really cool behind the scenes stuff on photo shoots that i do and you might want to follow along now one of my final favorite things on this camera is the custom shooting modes if you shoot the same thing a lot it would just be in your best interest to set these up all you have to do, dial in the settings on the camera you want, head over to tab 5 under the wrench or the setup menu, and hit custom shooting mode. Hit register settings, select whether you want it to save to C1, C2, or C3, and hit OK. And now every time you turn the camera on and set it to C1 using the mode dial, you're going to get those same settings right back to where you had them. If you change the settings while shooting in a custom mode and you change the battery or turn the camera off, when you turn the camera back on or put in the battery again, it's going to go right back to those default settings. So if you made any changes while you're shooting, you'll have to make those changes again. And that's pretty much it. I'm a pretty simple guy when it comes to video, but hopefully that helped you understand a little bit about how to use this camera and some of the important points. Just to review, I want you to remember that this camera can shoot in 10-bit 422 inside the body, which basically means an incredible amount of data and a lot of flexibility if you're shooting in that C-Log mode. So whether you're gonna shoot in 1080, 4K, or even 8K, it gives you an incredible amount of latitude when editing. However, because it does shoot in H.265 codec instead of H.264 when you're in 10-bit, it's gonna make that footage harder to edit. So you're gonna to need to make those proxy files as you import them into Final Cut or into a Premiere, depending on which program that you use. Hopefully some of that was useful to you. Like, subscribe, hit the notification bell. Leave me a comment if you have questions about the video. And if I know the answer, I'll certainly be able to help you. If I don't, I'll let you know that too. Thank you again for watching, and I'll see you next time.